So one of the things that really differentiates this stream color display from others, and I'm specifically talking about the Z27X, is how it's calibrated. When we design the display, we talk to our customers in visual effects and animation primarily and ask them, what do you need? And one of the things they told us for the next generation is we need to be able to have a way to easily calibrate and redeploy. At this point, they had been a lot of times using a custom Linux application that they developed for calibration. It was a little bit cumbersome. It was not easily uh, distributable out. They couldn't easily deploy it. So it was a bit more difficult. They had to have more of a specialized IT person to do it. And calibration is critically important for these guys because every single monitor needs to look the same. And from their perspective, it also has to look exactly like their projection screen. Yeah. So whatever the projector looks like, the monitors better look the same as well. So we asked them about what they really would want if we could give them their dream solution. And they told us they wanted two things. One, it'd be nice if it's inside the monitor. It was the quality that we wanted. And let us use instruments, which are the kind of instruments that we use already. So in this case, what we decided to do was take the calibration and put it inside the monitor. The calibration is based on the code that the studios were already using for their calibration. So we took a lot of their algorithms for color management and the way that they calculate the color gamut matrices and integrate into the code that we put inside the monitor. We also made sure that they could support a number of different instruments. For example, we have the x uh, i1 display, which is available for use. It's about a $250 device. It calibrates well, and it's a perfect solution for a smaller shop, a smaller facility that doesn't have a lot of monitors. If you have a ton of monitors, though, this is not necessarily the best solution. At $250, it doesn't necessarily have the degree of accuracy that you would want. And certainly, it doesn't have the degree of accuracy that compared to what you might be calibrating your projector with. So we asked them, what do you want us to use? And they said, well, for example, the client instruments K10A. This is what we use. This is what we want you to support. We also asked for the photo research spectroradiometers. So I don't have one of them right here, but basically there's a whole line of those. Those are pretty much the kind of the industry standard for a lot of projection calibration. So we directly support those plug and play into the monitor. So this is the USB connector for the client. The way calibration works is on the bottom of the display, I have two different sets of USB connectors. One set is for a standard USB hub that you hook up to the computer so you can hook up flash drives, phones, etc. to the monitor. This is a client behind your workstation. The others, though, are what we call the dream color ports, and these are to connect directly into the monitor. So I'm going to plug this unit right into the monitor. Because it's USB powered, it takes a few seconds for this to initialize and wake up. And what it does, it brings up a message that says, hey, I see the calibration. What do you want me to do? I can either recalibrate the current preset. And if it's set up the way I want, I just want to do it over. I'll hit select. Then I literally just positioned this in front of the monitor and tell it to start the calibration. And it'll run through the whole calibration process. I can also, I'll back up here, tell it that I want to create a new preset. And now I can do a menu-driven way. I can choose the preset I want to adjust. Let's say I want to change Adobe into something more suitable for video. I can choose the gamut that I want. Maybe I want this to be 601, because I'm doing some, some NTSC or work. So I'll select that. Uh, D65 is the right white point for video, so I'll choose that. And because I'm going to be working in a dark environment, I'm going to choose a gamma of 2.4. If I was in a lighting like this, I'd probably choose a gamma of 2.2. But I'll choose 2.4 because I'm in a typical environment. Because it's dark, I'm going to ask it to calibrate to relatively dark value. It shows me what it is that I've asked it to calibrate. I can then confirm and once again point onto the display. And I'm going to let the calibration run. And because we're in bright room, I'm not going to do that. It's not going to give me a great looking calibration with all this fluorescent light. Calibration really should always be done in a dim environment or a dark environment. Certainly a 
dim light environment is fine for this instrument because it has a direct contact. But if I'm working on something like a photo research spectroradiometer, that is a distance device. So I need to make sure the room is dark. Typically, you, you calibrate that like you have in a theater. It's in total darkness. But we've gone a little bit further because a lot of our studio customers, let me just, excuse me for pulling this out of my pocket here. Excuse me, gotta stand up, it's in the other pocket, I can't reach it. Cut that out, please. <laughs> uh, what we've gone one step further because since we were designing this to our customers in the studios, what they told us is it's great to send inside the display, but we need this to be easily repeatable and deployable. So because a lot of them will have very specific types of calibration, it may be a standard 709 gamma, but they may have a specific gamma that they like to use. Some don't always use, let's say, DCI at 2.6. Some use DCI at 2.2. Some use 709 at, believe it or not, 1.6. It's whatever it is that they need, we want to make sure they can repeat this and they have a specific luminance. Some say we're going to do it 100. Some say we're going to do it at 80. Some say we're going to do it at 75. Whatever they want, we want to make it easy. So what we've done is we've given them the ability via a USB stick. I'm going to set this on the floor for a moment. To write an XML file. And this is called StudioCal. It has a StudioCal.xml is the name of the file. And this gives us the ability to use an HP created calibration schema where I can tell it, for example, I want you to validate after you're calibrated. I could choose to archive the lookup tables and it will write them back to the flash drive after it does the calculations. I'm telling it where to store it, what to name it, what my gamma is, what my primaries are, which includes my an X, Y, or UV color. I can say, here's my luminance, here are all my values. I can tell it to use measurement averaging if I have an instrument that is not as accurate at the low black level, such as the x right i1 display. I can specify that. I can set up my validations. They can do this for exactly what they need and then just simply plug it into the display and have it be your calibration. So if I come back over to the display, my instrument is already plugged in, so I'll just add the USB stick. It's going to read the stick and it's going to tell me, hey, here I am, but oh, by the way, I happen to find both calibration and firmware on this memory stick. Do you want to update the firmware or do you want to calibrate? This would only pop up if it saw both types of files, and it did. So, hey, by the way, firmware update, as you just mentioned, is a USB stick. You take a firmware file that you download off hp.com, copy it to a memory stick, and stick it into the monitor, and then it will firmware update. Usually, a monitor is updated if you can by sending it back to the manufacturer and they ship you a new one because you can't update firmware. It's kind of an unheard of thing, but we're doing it because it gives us the ability to then go in and add features. You know, certainly also fix bugs because you know there's no such thing as bug-free software anymore. It's too complex. So if we encounter bugs or if customers encounter them, we can fix them very easily. Take the monitor and ship it to them. Let it time out and put it back in again. We'll come back up again. They'll ask me what I want. I'm going to tell it this time I want to do studio calibration. Okay, it says okay. I have a studio cal file. Do I want to use it? I'll say yes. It checks the file. There were no there were no errors. So now it just says okay. Put position the instrument. I put the instrument over the target, or if it's a distance measurement device, I just aim it at the target, and I choose start calibration and then the calibration is going to run. So the whole thing is designed to be very easily repeatable and deployable so that I can literally send someone out around the, around the um, facility with a calibration device and a USB stick and they just walk from one to the other to the other and they do their calibration. So it makes it a whole lot easier to do. And to take it one step further, because this is a really customizable display, one of the things we've created for the display is an API. So inside this display, we have the ability to, via USB, take and write programs to completely control the display. Now, why would that be interesting? 
But one of the reasons it's so interesting is that this means that an IT department in a facility or in a VFX studio, what they can do is they can write custom code to track the monitor. For example, a lot of them have IT management dashboards where they can look at all the machines that are out there and where they are, how they're configured, how they're functioning, and so on and so forth. They can now also tie these monitors into that dashboard by writing a program with our SDK. And we found that there are folks that have already started working on their SDK. It's very simple, it's straightforward, it's documented, source code is available, sample programs, and compile <laughs> binaries. So they're able to quickly integrate this into their system. Initially, it's going to be available as compiled binaries on Linux and on Windows. Mac will be coming out later this year, probably sometime during the summer. But it gives us, again, really simple ways of being able to check across their whole facility which monitors are needing calibration. They can look at the hours on all their displays and say, okay, this, 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 this is today's job is you have to go out and calibrate these monitors. It's a whole lot easier than what they've had to do before, which is they go from monitor to monitor, how many hours, write it down, and every so often go back and check. Now that as you have 300 monitors, this is a big deal because it makes it so much easier to manage your workflow. You know, it's a facility you device. USB SDK. Okay, I don't have, um, let's have a document. You know, I can open up, here's the technical documentation. So there is, for everything you can see, description, API, example, and parameters, how you utilize it. So it's fully documented. We also provide API package, which includes for Linux and Windows. We have your libraries for Linux. We have libraries for Windows. We have your full source. So I can actually look at any of these source files and I can find out, you know, sample code. For example, if I, on the API, let me, it doesn't have a program to use it, let's use Notepad. Oh yeah, Notepad doesn't display this very well. Let's see if Word wraps better. Yeah, Word, Word, Notepad's pretty terrible for that. Let's try something else. I don't use Notepad personally, so I didn't know it would do that. There we go, WordPad looks a little bit better. But you can see what we're providing. We're providing basically, you know, full sample code in terms of how it's utilized, how we can code it in, it's telling you exactly how things come in. So we're, we're providing a lot of information with the goal that we're literally giving you what you need to go ahead and effectively code your own software. So this is a big deal in many respects because we haven't really seen in the monitor space APIs become available for a monitor. I mean, I don't know if anybody can think of another monitor outside of some very high-end, very expensive medical displays that have APIs. And those medical displays, the API wasn't public. They used it primarily because it was needed in some hospitals for, um, to be honest with you, to make sure the lawyers were happy. And you had to license it and pay for it. And we're just releasing it. So anybody can program and drive and control this monitor. Because what we're really interested in here is what customers are going to do with it. Uh, honestly, the you know when you talk about a display or any product, you know one of the things you have to look at is why did you build this? And you could say you built it because well the competition has one and I want to have one too. You know when you look at new features, why do you add a new feature? A lot of people say, well, you know, the, I, we hear this is really cool, so we're going to add this. What we did was we literally, like I said, spent two years with our customers. And everything that we did in this monitor is because customers asked for it. And a lot of these things like the API, like the way we calibrate, is entirely designed so that it makes the workflows our customer have be more efficient. We're enabling things they couldn't do otherwise. You know, I had a, a great experience when I went through the API and I went through all the remote management we have with one of the large uh, animation studios. Um, it, it was really cool. They sat back and said, you know, before you came, we brainstormed amongst ourselves, what could we do? What, uh, he said he's got an API. What are some of the things we could do? And he says, you not only included every single thing we thought of, but there's stuff that we didn't think of, and now we know we need. 
So it's a big deal for us because this is about enabling customers' workflows to be more efficient. Uh, it is a color critical monitor first and foremost. It's got to be accurate. But I think we're really opening up a new way of approaching an infrastructure to a monitor that people haven't looked at as a monitor before. It's not just the commoditized, you order so much, so many inches. You know, it's how can we make your workflow more efficient? So the, what we decided to do when it came to looking for support in 4K is our first focus was the quality of the actual LCD panel. What could we get in terms of quality? Because we wanted this to be a color critical display that our high-end customers could be happy with. That was what was most important, okay? Formats was important, but quality was critical. So what we were able to find and develop a 27 inch technology that gives us the color criticality we need. Very accurate, very deep rich blacks, nice wide color gamut, very stable. Those were really critically important. And so we proceeded to move on with the, with the Dream Color 27X. So that made a whole lot of sense to us because we could deliver the technology they needed. When 4K became very interesting and people were starting to look in 4K, one benefit we saw with the technology we adopted and were working with this display is that we could push 4K through the system. So we started to look at what the viability was to get 4K through. Knowing that we weren't gonna have a 4K panel, we'd already committed to and we're doing a design of a 2560 by 1440 panel. In order to support 4K, we began to work on developing a scaling algorithm that would give us a very naturalistic scale down from 4K to what is essentially 2.5K, 2560 wide. We were very happy with the results. It took us a while until we iterated down to give us a good result. But we found that we would get a really nice looking image that would allow you to do composition, have color accurate for seeing proper lighting, especially if used on set. And if you wanted to go down and look at tight focus for critical focus, you could introduce one of our pixel for pixel modes so you can zoom in on an area of interest in the frame and see pixel for pixel for focus checking. We decided that that would be a good approach for this kind of interim time before 4K, in our opinion, becomes really viable and color critical. So our display gives you the ability to take 4K in, focusing on film workflows. So it's 4K at 24. We'll also support for video 3840 wide at 30. But we're not going beyond that for now because it wasn't viable in the technology we had we committed to for the design. We'll take those in, we'll let you see full frame, we'll let you see scanning around pixel for pixel. But again, the, I, the real key was, is it gonna be color accurate, okay? When it comes time to doing a 4K, true native 4K display, we're not gonna do a 4K dream color until we literally have a panel that makes sense. So certainly I can't talk about anything that we haven't announced yet. So I can't tell you that, oh yeah, we're doing this XY or we're not doing this XY. I can't talk about a period. But I can tell you that what we are trying to do is find and identify when the technology is right. And it's not just to make sure we have the best possible panel, but do we have the right engine, the right architecture, the right scaler is part of the technology to let us do 4K correctly. And that means, do we have a quality of scaler that lets me actually do the color management at the level of quality that I want? Until I can identify all of those pieces, it doesn't make sense for us to go forward with a true 4K dream color. Because we're not gonna just slap a label on a 4K display and say, hey look, it's color critical. Because if we're not confident that our highest end customers will agree with that, then there's no point in doing it.